Okay, let's take a look at wrist pain. But before we dive into the wrist, I just want to point out that if we turn on all of the nerves that go down to the wrist and into the hand, uh, we cannot ignore the fact that they stem from the spinal cord up here. And then they have their various branches that come from right here in the front of the shoulder. They branch off towards the back, down the side, down the inside, the outside. But they all ultimately stem from the cervical area, okay? So whenever I am screening anyone, even with a shoulder, elbow, or wrist, or hand injury, I am always going to screen the neck because these are communicating nerves that go all the way up and down. They form loops of communication, so very important to take note of. So now let's zoom in a little bit more on the wrist. I'm going to take these nerves off at first because I want to look just structurally. So I'm not going to name every single ligament structure in here, but just take note that there are these large ones that are called intercarpal ligaments and they are connecting all these various smaller carpal bones together. Uh, then there are ones that are going to, instead of just holding these small bones together, they're going to connect up to the forearm, right? So if we're looking at this one, it's connecting your radius over. This is connecting your ulna down. Then there are ones that connect the radius and the ulna bone together. So things like climbing, where you're having to use a lot of forearm strength, you're also relying on a lot of ligaments. And so something to point out is that you can have loads of muscle strength as far as tendons go um, in support, but ligaments do not have muscle attachment. They are only bone to bone. And when they stretch out, uh, they lose their stability. Okay, And we have to gain stability from somewhere else. So things that have a lot of overuse strain, ligament-wise, they, they end up needing rest. Um, so that's why you'll see much more splinting in the form of like wrist and finger splinting because there's so much that is ligament stability as opposed to muscle stability like the shoulder or the hip or something like that. So you can see that there are a ton, so I'm not going to name all of these little ligaments in here, but they are, like I said, either connecting these small carpal bones together or they're connecting it up to the forearm. Now on the ulnar side, so on the pinky side of things, there is what is called um, your TFCC which is your, it's a fibrocartilaginous connection of ligaments, particularly on this ulnar side, where this bigger space exists, um, and you can have tears in it, but that is where that lives in this general zone. So let me take off these ligaments so you can actually just see the bony structure a little bit better. So when you hear people talk about their wrist, generally they are referring to this location right here where the forearm bones meet this first layer of carpal bones, but there is a lot of stuff also that plays into this second row of carpal bones. So all of this is the wrist, okay? So there's lots of little things to take note of. Let's flip it around. When I'm assessing somebody and they have a hard time extending their wrist, like bringing it up, not away from their palm side, I should say, a lot of times, and you'll see how on the end of these bones, they're all, they're very rounded. So if I were to just solo out this bone, it's rounded, it's covered in cartilage, everything like that. Um, and what that role is, and you can see how I got in this guy, it's more, it's concave, right? So where we just saw the other rounded part, it sits really nicely in this little concave groove. So when I am looking at wrists and people are like, yeah, I really have a hard time taking my wrist back, I'm going to pay attention to this joint line here because what happens, I'm going to see if I can show it to you a little bit from the side. Do a little bit of drawing on it. Okay, so you can see the concavity there and how this is convex. So if we need the wrist to be, the wrist itself, so the whole hand, to be able to extend this direction, right? If this bone right here, as we are extending that up, this bone has to be able to glide back. Otherwise, when it comes up, everything is going to pinch here. So a lot of times I will do a lot of joint mobilizations where this whole row, I'm working on really giving it a glide towards the palm side so that as things come up, they have room to actually roll. It's called a roll and glide concept, but that is why I do those joint mobilizations. Okay, now let's take a little bigger look up the forearm and let's actually look at muscle connections. So in particular, we'll talk about climbers here. 
Okay, so we'll just start with all of them and they'll probably take some layers off in a moment. Now, when we're talking about grip strength, most of it is controlled by the larger muscles on this side of the forearm. Okay, so this is your flexor carpi radialis, meaning what it's gonna do is actually flex the hand at the wrist joint, okay? It's going to move it out towards your thumb side. Palmaris, this one's gonna come down and it's also going to flex the wrist and it's gonna stabilize the hand. And then if we are looking at this one, flexor carpi ulnaris, so it is also flexing the hand, but it's gonna deviate the hand towards the pinky side. Let's take that off. Okay, flexor digitorum. This one is huge in climbing, especially for the people that get into those really advanced grips where it's just their fingertips. So this is going to help flex the fingers, okay? But if you see, they all stem off of this inside part of the elbow. Here, yeah, I covered that one. Okay, now if we are looking at this guy, this is called your brachioradialis muscle. Uh, we often joke about this one being called your beer drinking muscle because when you are holding a heavy glass, it'll pop up right there on the top side of your forearm. Okay, now you also need, we'll get this guy first. Oh, we already did, we already did flexor carpi ulnaris. Okay, so now you'll see all of these on the back side. You also need those in your grip strength because when these flex and extend your wrist backwards, they also have a secondary mechanism of flexing your fingers. So climbers need both sides to be significantly strong for stability of hand grip, everything like that. Now, you'll see that all these tendons, they cross over the ones that go into the hand themselves, they cross over this wrist joint. So they are inherently adding stability, um, but a lot of climbing positions are really kind of looking at a funky end range position of some of them. So these muscles, if they're not strong at end range, have a hard time stabilizing and then you fall back onto just ligament structure. So wanted to point that out. All right, last things that I wanted to show are nerves. This is another good one to point out. That also does your thumb. Thumb strength is huge. So this comes all the way up from the forearm. All right, let's look at some nerves in here. So there are a ton of nerves. Let's talk specifically pain out here on pinky side in regards to nerves, okay? So you have, this is a, this is more one that's gonna deal with numbness, things like that. But it comes down and it goes right on the front side. So like your funny bone nerve is your ulnar nerve and it sits back here. This one sits right on the front side, but it does the skin on the inside part. And it does a little bit on uh, towards the, the front, the back side, not the front, excuse me. But if we are not paying attention to that one, let's take off some of these just sensory ones. Okay, your ulnar nerve. So this one travels all the way down right behind. This is the groove. This is where your funny bone lives. It comes all the way down and then it crosses over the pinky side of your wrist. And it actually has a lot of things that it does. So it starts from the low cervical area. It comes down and it's doing most of the muscles that flex your hand towards the palm side and flex your fingers down. It also does a lot of these smaller muscles inside of the hand. So all things, grip strength, stuff like that. Uh, where it tends to get irritated on people is around this elbow joint. It also can get a little irritated up in the tricep region. And then where it stems off of the actual brachial plexus can be a little bit problematic too, just depending on kind of the person's posture, how they are tending to sit. If people get that very rolled forward shoulder, sometimes these nerves can all get a little bit um, restricted. When you have any kind of nerve restriction, whether it's caught up in muscle tissue or it's inflamed for whatever reason, you're going to feel it in a form of either weakness or pain or gonna feel like muscle tension. So that's a common one that I look at on people. Now this one, 
is your median nerve. So people that have carpal tunnel, you would typically hear about the median nerve. It comes down and it supplies thumb, first finger, part of your second and ring finger. And it also comes in front, but it sits right underneath all of these huge muscles that we were just talking about as far as grip strength and wrist flexion, stuff like that. So where it can get caught up, let's zoom in just a little bit. So it can get kind of caught up in some of these muscular areas. Okay, now when we're looking at radial side of the palm, which is your thumb side, let's take a look at this nerve here. This is called your radial nerve. It comes down, this is technically a superficial branch of it, meaning it's more surface level and does more sensation, but it comes right here on this thumb side of the wrist and it goes into web space and then it has this other branch that comes off of it. And it does sometimes sensation to the fingertips, things like that. Um, it also does the lateral three digits also. Okay, so we've looked at the major nerves. That is why when people say they have wrist pain, I don't only think of ligaments, especially when they don't have an actual injury in place. Uh, when it's something that's come over, over a longer period of time, we got to look at all the things that are involved, whether it's muscular, involving its tendons, whether it's ligament, whether it's just purely a joint mechanic issue, whether there's nerve involvement, but it all stems from much higher up the chain. So I tend to look at the entirety of that. So hopefully that makes sense.